Today in Ancient DOS Games, we're taking a look at Pharaoh's Tomb, the predecessor to Arctic Adventure, which I'd covered in one of the very early ADG episodes many years ago, before I even had a decent microphone even. And I figured it was about time to get around to this one and see how it compares, and get an idea of if Arctic Adventure was an improvement or a downgrade from its roots. And the answer to that question is definite improvement. Arctic Adventure had its frustrations for sure, but playing through it didn't feel like a chore. Pharaoh's Tomb, however, has some design choices which make it pretty much impossible to play through without abusing its saving and loading mechanics. And not too far into the third episode, I finally got fed up to the point of just not wanting to go any further. But as was typical for early Apogee titles, the later episodes are really just more of the same anyways, so I'm pretty sure I'm not missing much. Pharaoh's Tomb was developed and released by George Broussard before his days at Apogee under his old MicroFX software branding back in 1990, and it's a one-player platformer. It supports CGA 320x200 four-color graphics and PC speaker sound, and as for its current release date, it's been freeware for quite a number of years now, and can still be downloaded from the 3D Realms website at www.3drealms.com. Yep, shortest game stats we've had in a while. Just like with Arctic Adventure, the story's paper thin and told in just a couple pages of text. Basically, you play the role of a research assistant known as Nevada Smith, who's completely fed up with his boss always going out on treasure hunts while he has to stay behind. And now that said boss is trying to claim Nevada's most recent discovery for his own, Nevada decides he's had enough. So he swipes the treasure map in the middle of the night and heads out on adventure on his own accord to some ancient Egyptian pyramids to discover the treasure for himself. That's simple enough, though I find it laughable how in the second episode, he indirectly calls beef jerky not real food. I mean seriously, has Nevada even seen the prices of beef jerky? A single snack sized portion of this stuff costs about as much as a foot long sub. But yeah, the gameplay is fairly straightforward. All you do is run left and right, jump, and toss spears. Although you can only have five spears in your possession at a time, so you need to be extra careful not to use them unless you have to. Beyond that, your main goal is to find the orge key in every level, and use it to escape out of a door to the next level, with 20 levels to clear in each of the four episodes, making for a total of 80 levels. Now, to be fair, this game isn't bad by default. The idea is sound, and if there weren't issues with the controls, it might actually be enjoyable. But, yeah, there's some serious problems with the controls. One of the key issues which persisted from this game into Arctic Adventure was that jumping behaves in a very weird way, in that you can't jump and move on the same frame. Otherwise, you don't jump at all, you just move. This can be adapted to, but it kind of goes against one's gaming sensibilities and might mess with your ability to play other platformers if you're not careful. However, given some of the things the game expects you to get through, having the jumping controls partly busted makes it very difficult to survive. For starters, the hit detection is all kinds of messed up. In fact, George knew this was an issue, but didn't have an easy fix. So there's a message at the end of the instructions talking about how powerful the animation system is, but warning about getting too close to things which could kill you because of its optimizations, and it's not kidding. Really? That hit me? There had to be a freaking mile between me and that thing. This also makes jumping over enemies surprisingly difficult, particularly the slow ones, because just clipping the edges of one can be deadly, yet sometimes it's not. See, one of the inconsistencies about this game is that because of the way everything times out, sometimes solid collision handling is processed before collision handling for hostile objects, resulting in Nevada sort of skidding along things which should have made him dead. Which, I mean, I'm not complaining when it works out that way, I just complain about when it doesn't. Now let's talk about the overall design, because it's chock full of evil. In fact, I measured it. I ran the executable file through my evil detector, which gives a rating between 0% evil and 100% evil, and it crashed. I mean, geez, how much more evil can you get if you have to crash an evil detector to hide your true evilness? But yeah, for starters, you have extra lives. 
Arctic Adventure wised up and lacks an extra live system, but in this game you can only have up to 5 lives at a time, and if you run out of lives, it's game over and back to the beginning. Again though, there's a saving and loading system, and even though you can only get one save going at a time, it saves all of your stats as well, so there's pretty much no reason to ever accept the death and move on. Not to mention, if you get trapped in a level, there's no reset button. If you haven't been saving, then your only options are to quit out entirely and start over, or save and restore, which will put you back to the start of the level anyways. Now that alone isn't very evil, but it gets better. This game has a coins mechanic, similar to the original Super Mario Bros. games, wherein if you collect 100 coins, you get an extra life. Well, not only do your coins not stick with you between lives when you die, but if you get 100 coins and get an extra life, it zeroes out the coins count if you happen to die again, so as to prevent getting another extra life. Now that's cruel, given that the rest of the time you simply go back to however many coins you had when the level started. The icing on the cake, though, are the traps. Now some of the levels have hidden spots where if you touch them, the layout of the level will change a little. Sometimes in a beneficial way, but often not, making it impossible to finish the level, and also making it so that some of the items strewn about are absolutely impossible to get without touching one of these and halting your progress then and there. And these traps are all over the place, so you pretty much can't one-shot this game. You need to use the saving and loading feature if you want even just a small chance of survival. I should point out too that the same mechanic in Arctic Adventure of banging your head into ceilings to find hidden loot is still a thing in this game too with some of the point-based loot spots being random, but some always being in the same place, not to mention any such spots loaded with coins don't move, they'll always be in the same spot. Ultimately though, this was the moment in the third episode which made me stop playing, because this level was deceptively dangerous and took numerous attempts to get to where I did, despite its simplicity, only to discover... <sighs> yeah, that. Overall, Pharaoh's Tomb set the groundwork for Arctic Adventure, yet despite its flaws, Arctic Adventure is absolutely a superior game, and I would much rather be playing that one over this one. Even though technically, both of them kinda do aggravate me a bit. Remember, these games came out in the early 90s, and even on DOS, they were already competing against superior platformers with superior graphics, sound, controls, to say nothing about how much better the platformers typically ended up being on the consoles of the time. But, that said, it's still an important point in the history of Apogee software, and now that it's freeware, it's kinda hard to complain too strongly about it. Also, it was only $25 when it was first released, to order all four of the episodes, back at a time when most games on store shelves cost twice that. If you've never checked out Pharaoh's Tomb or Arctic Adventure, they're definitely worth a look, but probably not much more than that by this point in time. Although again, the premise and intent of the gameplay is sound, so a modern remake of the game using a modern engine while retaining the same graphics and level design would actually probably work out pretty well. All you gotta do to get this game running its best is set a fixed cycles count of 3000. It does work with the auto and max settings, but not as well. Yep, even the DOS box config is a short one this time around. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Bit of a shorter one than usual, but I wanted to cover something simple so I could spend some time recovering from how tricky and long last week's game was. As for next Saturday in episode 240, we'll be taking a look at a different platformer, starring a mascot character few people talk about anymore, since said mascot really didn't do much of anything else. If you think you know which game that might be, then be sure to send your guests to ADG at Pixelships.com and stay tuned to see if this game I've got lined up is actually any good. Thanks for watching everyone, and special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Here's a small random set of you guys.